Thank you uh, so much for joining us with this edition of the Albers Executive Speaker Series. My name is Joe Phillips. I'm Dean of the Albers School and delighted to welcome everyone here. This evening, we are going to hear from Jim Weber, CEO of Brooks Running. The theme of his presentation tonight is Leading with Purpose, which is based upon the title of a book he recently uh, authored. This is our first speaker event of the year, so we're very excited to be here and doing it face-to-face. Uh, and uh, before I introduce Jim, I will briefly remind you about the format. So he will make a presentation of about 15 minutes. Then he will answer questions from uh, three panelists who I will introduce to you later. And then I will also mix in questions that we have received from the audience in advance. So uh, first I want to mention that Jim Weber joins an elite group of business leaders tonight who have participated in the Albers Executive Speaker Series three times, right? This is his third visit. His prior times were 2006 and 2014. So he comes every eight years, it seems. So he'll be back in 2030, I think. Um, you might wonder who else is in this distinguished group, right? And there's only three other people. Jim Sinegal. Uh, Leo Hendry, and Alan Maloli. So that's pretty good company, Jim, and thank you for coming back a third time. Uh, Jim Weber joined Brooks Running uh, Company as CEO in 2001, and he's credited for the company's impressive turnaround story. The business and brand success was so striking that Warren Buffett made Brooks a standalone subsidiary company of Berkshire Hathaway in 2012. Jim's professional journey includes leadership roles for several consumer product brands, such as Sims Sports, O'Brien International, Coleman Company, and Pillsbury. He received his bachelor's degree from the University of Minnesota, and he has his MBA from Dartmouth. So with that, please join me in welcoming Jim to Seattle University. I have a wireless. Is this working? Sounds like it. So I'll set this one down. Well, um, thank you, Dean, and uh, the president's here as well. It's absolutely an honor to be here three times. It's amazing, but I really mean that. I love being in the learning environment. If I could get paid to go to school, I might be in your seat right now um, if I didn't have to make a living. But um, this is a big topic, leading with purpose. I have a lot of passion uh, on it. Um, and, uh, and it's important, been in, super important to me. So I'm just gonna introduce it using the Brooks story and, and just share a little bit of the Brooks journey um, in these early minutes and then we'll dive into some questions on it. So um, leading with purpose, um, I wrote a book as, as Joe mentioned and I really wanted to document the Brooks story. The Brooks story, it's a great turnaround story. It's a great challenger brand story in an industry with big, big, big brands, great brands, global brands. It's a David and Goliath story, but it's also a purpose-driven brand story and, and how we've made that come to be. So Brooks today, um, many of you may be familiar with us, um, but you might not be. We're, we're sort of super uber focused on running and runners. So, but it's our 21st year uh, as a company um, focusing on running and, and only doing that. We're 105 plus years old. We were a full line athletic footwear and apparel company before this, this pivot to run. We're headquartered here in Seattle. Our headquarters is in the, the Fremont neighborhood, right by Gasworks Park. And uh, we have about 1,300 employees. We're a, I view us as a small global company. Um, we have a big, a nice business in Europe. Um, and what we do is, is performance running gear, premium price performance running gear. And we present it with a kind of a run happy ethos. It's really about celebrating your run, whether you're competing literally at the Olympic level and, and trying to get to the podium, or you just started uh, to run around the block and, and move. So uh, it's a huge market, and that was a key thing for us. We're playing in a market that's something like $30 billion in total um, globally. The addressable market is everybody with feet, including walkers, so it's much bigger than that. But it's, uh, it's at least 150 million people that run regularly for fitness, competition, or what have you. So um, we hit a big milestone in 2021. 
We've had growth goals because we want to build our brand with runners and we want to add more runners into our brand and be more meaningful and obviously compete in this very competitive category. So in 2021, we passed the billion dollar milestone, which was huge for us. Um, and it came from an intense focus on the runner and just execution year in, year out. It's not an overnight success. It wasn't luck, it wasn't easy. Um, and the backstory is a colorful one. Um, so, you know, we anchored in on purpose. Um, and we really, uh, early on, um, wanted to build a brand with purpose. In the early years, in the turnaround years, when, when we were fighting for survival, we decided to focus on runners and premium performance running gear. Then we got into a room and we said, you know, what should our mission be? What should our vision be? And, and that's a, actually an interesting story. We decided on a purpose. And, and we decided to commit to this purpose of inspiring everyone to run their path. And then there were two key attributes of that purpose that are super important, I think, for a, especially for a for-profit business, but maybe for any organization, is, is you know, the why. Why, why were you know, the, this inspire everyone was really built on the fact that running really is a, a limitless source of positive energy. It's really important to a lot of people to move every day. And if you, if you move, if you run, um, if you're outdoors, it, it'll make your day better. It just will. And you add days up and it makes your life better and 150 million people. It's just a positive force in people's lives and, and in the world. And then the key was who? I think, I think your focus target customer is the most important decision that every business makes. It's just so critical. And we anchored in on runners, the running community, and truly anybody that puts one foot in front of the other. So, you know, for me, it includes walking, fortunately, because I'm doing more walking than running these days. But that focus um, for our purpose was key, especially for a for-profit company, because I think it keeps you, you're able to get a flywheel going and stick to your purpose if it's delivering for your customer. So um, along the way, and this is super important, your purpose is going to be tested. And this is true for people, and it's true for organizations, and it's true for businesses. And like in tough times, your true values come out. I think anchoring on a purpose, um, tough times are going to challenge you on what really matters. And, and the decisions you make in challenging times um, really say a lot about what your priorities are, what your focus is, and who you really are as a brand, as a business. And, you know, a, a business is not a human being. It's not a person. So I think having these conversations inside and making decisions as a team against this purpose is something that we put right in front of us. And here's been the key for us. One of the reasons I was able to write the book and I'm here for the third time talking about Brooks is we've, we've used these defining moments or challenging times, I said, to turn them into defining moments for our brand. Because we are customer focused and we, we stayed true to really focusing on the runner, even if they were changing, evolving, they were, behavior was changing, shopping things were changing. We were following the runner and trying to stay with them uh, as things evolved and changed. And so, you know, the Brooks journey has been really colorful. Um, there's kind of four big moments that I think we had to navigate through um, and that we successfully stayed focused on the customer and, and true to our purpose. And on every one of these, we came out stronger. We just came out as a stronger brand and a stronger organization. The dot-com bubble burst in, in 01, and we had a lot of internal issues. We were not profitable. We had too much debt. It was private equity backed. And, and so that's when we anchored in on, on inspiring people to run their path and a focus on trying to build the best gear in the world. At every segment, at every price point, we're trying to build the best choice for the runner on any other brand in the world. And sometimes we do that and sometimes we don't, but that's the goal. Then we hit the Great Recession, which was actually married to a barefoot running phenomenon that if only everyone ran barefoot, there'd be no injuries. So shoes are hurting you. There was, no, there was no data on any of that, but we had to navigate through that. And we did successfully, we invested in R&D. Um, we really focused on bringing our brand to more runners and, and being in front of them. So, and then we went on to 2015 and 2016. This was really interesting um, because millennials were, were running, but not as much. And then they were, Everything else about them also was a little bit different. The way they shopped, the whole digital phenomenon, retailers were under pressure. We had probably seven or 800 stores that went out of business um, that we were selling into, including Sports Authority, which used to be a, a chain of sporting goods stores that doesn't exist anymore. 
But we navigated through that. We got focused on digital, taught ourselves how to execute digitally and engage with runners, not just for commerce, but to be engaged you know, with them in their shopping experience and looking for new gear. And of course, um, throughout the running, the running, their running uh, journey. And then the pandemic, we've all navigated through that. It challenged everyone. Um, and uh, and that, that was quite um, a, a challenge for our entire industry. And I believe we navigated that probably better than any other brand in our industry. And running made the cut. People went outside, went outdoors, ran, walked, hiked, trail running and the like. And, and we're fortunate in that regard. Our business actually recovered pretty quickly and we became a success story. And it's a little bit stickier um, maybe then uh, $4,000 exercise bikes that cost $60 a month. So we're doing fine. Um, but, uh, you know, I, it, I think the key is that in each one of these moments, we came through, we were stronger competitively at the end of them. And they were hard, they were challenging, they were difficult. Um, but navigating through them with a focus on our purpose and the customer, we came through stronger. So just a couple of high-level you know, sort of beliefs that I've come out of this, this journey with and some things we've learned. You know, I love this Benjamin Disraeli quote, um, the secret to success is constancy of purpose. And here's the truth. When I came to Brooks, it was the fourth president of a company job I had. I had done three other, frankly, they were all turnarounds. Guess what? After three years, we had success. We, we sort of got it to a next plateau. And in every case, they sold the company. And I left and I went on to do another one. So Brooks, when I got to Brooks, I put this on my whiteboard. I put it on my wall in my office because I wanted to keep myself focused. I just decided I want to play the long game. We had a private equity owner. They were going to sell in three or four years, but I was going to stay and play through that because I wanted to be a part of building a brand. And I had been a student of brands and great companies. And usually great brands can be great companies, but... When they are, they're really hard to compete with. And, and I, what I observed is they're not built in three years. They take much longer than three years to build. So I just wanted to stay focused. And obviously, this became, we became a purpose-driven brand. And, and, uh, and again, I think it's been the key to our success. If we'd have changed who we were in any one of those challenging moments um, and chased a sh what I call a shiny thing, um, we wouldn't have been as successful as we have been in our category. The next quote is a Thomas Jefferson quote, and I, I, I really anchored in on this quote in 2015 and 16 when everything was foggy and our market was shifting and you know, people were questioning whether performance running was even a category if, if millennials were not going to buy premium performance product, they were just going to buy good enough product. And you know, this quote, I think, really was, was powerful for me because... You know, in matters of style, swim with the current. In matters of principle, stand like a rock. That's it. That's what you have to do in those challenging moments. And, and then the runner changes, right? And, and here's the key part in, in business. You have to discern, you know, what's, what's style and what's principle. And those are not easy decisions, actually. And out of that time, we came out with performance is timeless. Nobody wanted performance brand. Our retailers were not asking for performance. They were asking for good enough $80 shoes, which we're not that good at making. We, there's great brands that make that product really well. So we anchored in on performance and never looked back. And it, it really gave us an incredible lead in our industry. Next, you know, and this, this is a, I have a story on this that I picked up in a business school class. Have a point of view. Have a point of view. Um, in, in business school, we had a professor who I love, John Shank, and we do the case studies and he'd say, you know, you got to make a decision. It's, it's fuzzy, it's crazy, but you're, the judgment required, you know, you're on one side of the river or the other, but you're in the middle, you're, you're up to your neck in water. Or, you know, the only thing in the middle of the road, pick a side, is dead skunks and yellow lines. I never forgot that. Don't be in the middle of the road, dead skunks and yellow line. And, and I think for, for a brand, for Brooks, for a challenger brand, for a niche brand, wow, the biggest risk we could take is to chase Nike. They're such a great brand. They're so, they're so iconic to anyone that's ever played a sport. Everybody understands that brand. So, you know, we worked really hard to be Brooks and to express our point of view, not to be, you know, somebody else, but to be Brooks, have a point of view. And I think that's actually less risky if, if you're thoughtful and, and you can understand the consumer 
than looking like uh, one of your competitors, especially a big one. And then another executive that I worked with early on in my career, I love strategy. I just, lo I love strategy. I love brand positioning. I, I just love that whole process of creating business plans and models and all of that. And, and when you're a small business, um, it's sort of all wrapped into executing and getting it done. But, you know, we, we had this moment where we had this fantastic vision we'd fall in love with. And, and she said, you know, um, vision without execution is hallucination. And I think that's, that's probably true with, with purpose in a way, too. So, you know, it's, it's all about execution. Um, and that means it's all about people. And I think business is a team sport. So we've worked so hard to build a team-based culture at Brooks that has a high standard of excellence, but works collaboratively and in a super connected way. So those are some takeaways um, from the book. Now you, you don't have to buy it, but you still could. So we've got time for questions, Joe, I think. I will introduce our panelists who are now on stage with me very briefly, and then they will get going with some questions, right? So uh, furthest from me is Marilyn Johnson. She has over 20 years of experience in the uh, ESG profession, right, which stands for Environmental, so Social, and Governance. Uh, business students should all know those initials, right? Uh, Marilyn recently joined uh, Exada in August, where she is responsible for developing strategic approaches to ESG for the company. And previously, she was at Clarivate and IHS Market, where she had done similar work. She is recognized as one of the top 500 most admired sustainability leaders, according to an American Energy Society and Honeywell report released in 2021. Uh, in addition to being a graduate of uh, Seattle U's Executive Leadership Program, she holds a Master's of Health Science degree from the University of Toronto and two undergraduate degrees from Queen's University in Canada. She's also a co-author with the Sherpa Institute, uh, working on the Sustainable Development Goals Corporate Guidebook Series. And most importantly, maybe, is she's also an avid runner and has completed some marathons. Uh, so uh, closest to me is Lance Mason. He's a... <laughs> <laughs> must, be, uh, must be the track team over there, huh? Um, Lance is a senior here at Seattle U. He's majoring in business economics. Uh, he's on our track team and on our cross-country team. And if you want to know what races he competes in, it's the 800 and 1500 meters in track and 8 or 10 kilometers in cross-country. He's uh, planning to come back next year to use his fifth year of eligibility. And Lance uh, grew up in Redmond, Washington, and has been a competitive distance runner since middle school. And then in the middle is Jacob Parker. He's a student. Okay. That's where the SEM students are. Uh, he grew up in the St. Louis area as he, as he is a student. He's a student in our MBA in sport and entertainment management program. He grew up in the St. Louis area. He graduated from the University of Mississippi with an undergrad degree in psychology and business after an internship at Cornell in their athletic department and then teaching incarcerated youth in Washington, D.C. He decided to come back to school and he joined our SEM program. As part of that program, he's currently working with the Seattle Seahawks on their data analytics team while also assisting Seattle U's University Rec competitive sports program. Jacob is the president of a family-run nonprofit Baleka. While Baleka began in South Africa, it is now expanded into an international organization dedicated towards creating healthy communities that are emotionally well, physically fit, engaged with nature, and educated about proper nutrition. So those are our panelists. Uh, Marilyn, you're closest, so I'll ask, let you ask the first question. Uh, I have this mic on. Is it on? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so reading your book, Jim, I really enjoyed that and, and your presentation here today and one thing that came out loud and clear is that um first of all that you love a big massive challenge it seems like there's nothing that you wouldn't take on but in our world that's so frenetic and crazy you seem to have this ability to have hyper focus mm -hmm. and how do you translate that and get everyone in your company <laughs> to stay that way when they're also you know going through challenges wow i you know i here's one thing i, I actually think quite a bit about is i think in one sense the essence of what we're trying to do at Brooks, 
of what our mission is and our goals and what we do, it's actually pretty simple. We're trying to create the best running gear in the world, present it to runners. They're going to have lots to choose from. More often than not, if they pick us, we're going to do great. How hard can that be? Then, the, then you start to scale globally, and it's really complicated. It's actually really hard. And that's where people come in and team and connect in this. And, you know, we're trying to take a brand, and, and uh, here in Seattle, we create it. And then we have to present it through over 15,000 retailers all around the world in over 50 countries. And we have to present it as a brand in the same way, more or less, but locally relevant. And uh, we're trying to do that in a giant category against companies that are massively bigger than us. So I, I think it's, it's not easy to do. It's hard. But what I do is I try to keep the essence of what we're doing very simple in the sense that everybody sort of can, can get what this company is all about. I've always wanted that. I've always wanted to work at a company that was going somewhere, had opportunity in a future, and was something that I was proud to talk about and, and be a part of. And it was something I, so I want that. And, uh, and so I've always tried to create that and our team has for, for all the employees. We've hired in the last two years, and a lot of it was virtual, over 500 people. And we're trying to bring them into this brand, bring them into this culture. So uh, no silver, you know, magic on, at all on it. But I, I do think it's a combination of, of holding, holding a vision and a, and a direction and opportunity with a playbook that's got all the resolution in it, all, all the plays lined out to connect everybody together as a team. And that's what our leadership team does. It's, 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 that's why it's so people-driven. Yeah. Hello, can you hear me? Perfect. Uh, Mr. Weber, what steps did you take to build a team around the values that you sought out for, for Brooks's brand? And how hard was it to find other authentic leaders to get you to your North Star? You know, I, I think it in the early days it's organic because we really, we really didn't identify leadership profiles that really were going to be successful at Brooks. As we grew um, to over 500, 700, 1,000 people, we had to do that. So, you know, when I talk to leaders, um, especially new leaders, that's where the key is because they set the tone. Morale is driven by leadership. If, if you look at, you know, the morale in an individual employee's feeling, most of it comes from their manager, whether they're happy or not. So we've done a lot of leadership development training around, you know, the hardest job in the world right now is a people manager, especially the senior level. You got to lead strategy. You got to lead the business plan and, and all the projects and execution that goes cross-functionally. So you got to work well with your peers. And then you've got a team of three, five, 10 people. You're responsible for their development and, and their work and guiding them and, and helping them be successful. So um, we've gotten really focused on that. We're making a huge investment in leadership and development because these jobs are so hard right now. You know, in, in a virtual mode, more meetings, all this stuff that's going on, I, I think it's made the, the manager's job so much harder. So um, we don't take it for granted. And uh, we're definitely trying to, we're hiring people. I would say the one thing we learned really quickly is if you don't want to be part of a team, you're not going to fit in at Brooks because it, it's not about us figuring it out and having a conversation with you, your peers will not put up with you. You know, if you're all about yourself and you're selfish, the organization is going to sort those people out really quickly. And that's what's happened. So I think, you know, leaning in on, on a team format is, is probably the one critical thing that is a, is sort of a litmus test coming in and, uh, and, and the team quickly figures that out. So to be successful, you definitely have to, have to want to work with other people. And connect in, uh, Mr. Weber. I gotta say, it's a it's a real honor and pleasure. Um, you mentioned uh, culture a couple times um, in your answers, and I was just wondering. Um, so the the pandemic uh, forced people out of their offices, and you know, there's a lot of pivoting to remote work. Um, and the situation now, you know, everything is getting much better, um, but people are kind of he hesitant to come back to uh, the offices. Um, in your book, you give credit to the collaborative, connected, um, team-based culture at Brooks. Um, and I got to say, in high school, uh, I had the opportunity of visiting your uh, corporate headquarters, um, and I was just amazed. Um, and so I guess my question is, uh, what is it like there now? Um, are most people back to the office at Brooks headquarters? 
And what is your feeling about the increasing trend towards remote work, replacing in-person work, and how could it impact your company culture? Yeah, I, you know, times are changing, right? And, and the workplace is changing and, and people's expectations around who they work for and how it looks are, are changing dramatically. I also think there's going to, for companies, there's going to be wor- more than one way to be successful. There's going to be all remote companies that for the way they do things, the way they do, they're probably be successful. And then there's going to be all in-person companies. And I think people, employees will self-select a little bit. For us, you know, um, we believe two things. One, there's been significant, you know, work-life balance benefits and focus benefits from, from having a more flexible environment and having time at home. And some people want all that. Um, and yet we know the power of getting in a, in, a, in a room with a whiteboard, solving complex problems and bouncing it around, you know, with people. We've all had so many experiences like that at Brooks where innovation, ideation, you know, really being creative and, and agile, that process, I missed it when we were all on video. So we're, we're, we're going to work on a blended basis. Um, most jobs are going to be blended roles, which we expect, you know, 40 to 60% of their time is going to be in the office. We haven't all gone all the way in implementing that because we didn't have enough space for people. We, we just literally didn't have enough desks and our CFO, Tom Ross is here, but we've been, we've been at, we're one of those weird companies that we're adding space. We just signed a lease on a brand new building. We'll double our space in the next two, three years. We need it. We are out of space, even for this new work mode. So, you know, we're, we're a little bit different in that regard. But I think what, what here's, a, here's a, a little hack that has really worked for us. We're doing free lunch Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays. Everybody's in. The young, <laughs> especially, I think our average age employee is, some, is quite young. Probably, I'm, I'm one of the old ones. It's probably... Our average age is probably 31, 33, something like that. And I think a lot of people young in their careers want to be in the office, and that's what we're seeing. So the line for lunch has gotten really long. <laughs> I think you got your money's worth now, right? That's Absolutely. It's working. It's yeah. a great investment. It's working. Uh, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit, and just with my sustainability um, career and, and experience, and mm-hmm. I love that I, I saw the sustainability development goals on your website Mm -hmm. and i was curious just how that evolved how you wove that into everything that you're doing yep so in the 2000s we were actually headquartered out in bothell at the time but our company was starting to grow and it it didn't take long at all where we getting emails and letters from customers saying what's your impact on the planet how do you make these products where do you make these products you know are the people treated well how much pollution comes out of it? What's the carbon? You know, that's that conversation started in the mid 2000s. And and so we quickly said, A, our, our employees living in Seattle, right? We all have a connection to the environment, really care about this. But we just said, it's pretty clear runners are going to care. They're get, they run outside for the most part, clean air, clean water. They're going to care about this. And so in, those, in the early days, we committed um, to having less less impact on the planet because we're making an impact on the planet. You know, a lot of the the materials we use are petroleum based. We want to take that to recycled and repurposed materials and we move products all around the world. You know, we're working at future manufacturing means more regional production to reduce that. But that, that journey started in the two thousands. We created a shoe called the green silence, which was a prototype concept shoe, but it was all recycled materials and it was uh, water-based glues and, just early technology that all came into our product line. So this last year we launched the number one selling shoe of ours is the Ghost. We did about 5 million pairs of it uh, this past year. It's the number one uh, selling running trainer in the United States. We went carbon neutral on that shoe is our biggest shoe. And it's the first high volume shoe in our industry that was, was carbon neutral. About 60% of the upper is recycled materials. And then the rest, we did very high quality carbon offsets. So we're on this journey. It's daunting. I would say, so we signed uh, Amazon's uh, climate pledge for 2040, coming 10 years old, earlier than the Paris Accords to neutral. And we're building roadmaps to that. I would say, you know, it's a big mountain um, and we're in the foothills, but we're focused on it. And we've got a roadmap um, on circularity. We hope to be um, having a, a circular uh, uh, system in place by the end of this decade. I, I think in materials we're getting better at, but the recycled material supply chain has got to develop further. 
um, we're going to have we're going to need a new a lot of new technology and manufacturing to get it regional. And so, but there's a couple other big companies that are also working on it. So we're hopeful. We just think we got to be we got to be manufacturing in the region. That's going to be the key a key to it, I think. But it's a it's a long road. In our industry, we believe it's table stakes. We just do. It, you, you you don't have an option. And and because I, I I refer to our planet goals and our people goals as as not as initiatives or or programs. I, I view them as convictions, which are sort of you know values with action behind them because they're attached to our brand. Runners care about running. Run, running should be the most inclusive sport in the world. It 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 can be. It hasn't been. So inclusivity is super important for our organization and the sport. And it's, it's one of those, you know, so that's the people side, you know, title nine, I'm old, came in the seventies and, and, and equalized women's sport funding at the college level. It created three generations since of active women in sport. They've driven our running category. You know, if you weren't, if you weren't addressing the women's market in the last 30 years in sporting goods, you didn't grow. So we have the same opportunity now to invite everybody into the run and actually grow the sport. So, so because it's attached to our brand, I, I hope it'll outlast me. It won't change every time, you know, leadership changes if it does. Um, and same on sustainability. And so, you know, again, we think it's table stakes. It's a long road, but um, we have to. We have to. And Europe feels the same way about it. They're, the intensity of focus on brands and products over there um, is, is really front and center. So we're on the journey. Yeah. Mr. Weber, um, there's a great metaphor in the reading that mentions that execution in business is like moving a wall of bricks forward. A few at a time, but each in sync or the wall will collapse. So when you first became CEO of Brooks Running, what pieces of the wall were easy to improve? And what were a few that you say you would struggle in or you did struggle yeah. in? I, I came up with that analogy really looking at great brands that were great companies. And I looked at them and it seemed like they do everything well. You know, of course, they competed on innovation or product or something. But when you look at them as a business, they just executed so well at so many things. They were really hard to compete with. So I had that analogy of if you just you can't just do one thing well, especially as you try to scale a business. You got to execute the whole playbook well. And uh, and so when I got to Brooks, um, we had a lot of issues. And and I went to my my second board meeting. We, we reset the plan in the first one in April, I joined, um, and we hit that plan for the first time Brooks hit a plan in five years. And then I came in July with what we had to do. And there were 12 things we had to do. And they related to getting cash flow, to pay off bank loans, to setting a product to grow for the next year, to getting rid of inventory, to resetting an apparel strategy, to resetting the team. But I had this list of 12 things and the board just looked at me and said, no, you're crazy. Which three? Pick three. You got to pick three. I said, you don't understand. We have to do all of these things um, or we're just not going to get over the chasm. And, and so I think um, business is not as simple as it looks. I, again, I think the essence and the idea is simple, but the execution, everything has to go forward. And, and that's why it's a team sport, because right now systems and processes to scale are as important as product, are as important as retail relationships and factory. Rel yeah, everything is important. Because there's, you know, I, I will never say this in public. This isn't really public, is it? <laughs> so the truth is, there's a lot of ways to fail as a leader. I mean, there's a lot of things that can trip you up. And we've had those things trip us up. So, so that's where, you know, and maybe it's like, you know, piloting a ship or something, but in weather and all that, you, you have to pay attention to a lot of things. And, and so our, our whole leadership team, our executive team, that's what we own. You know, we kind of own that whole picture. And now especially with how volatile and dynamic the economy is and the world is, that's even more true than ever before because, you know, we've had supply chain hiccups that, that we would have never had on our lists of risks that could happen to us. And with quarantines and COVID, we lost 45% of our footwear production for three months. That's a problem. Anyway, so that's the wall of bricks. You know, it's everything, nothing's not important. And that's what makes it a team sport. Everybody, everybody is, uh, is rowing the boat. Um, so you do talk about, um, you know, like how volatile the world is and 
Um, and you know, you, you do, man, you, I feel like Brooks does have a, you know, kind of world perspective in terms of run happy. Um, and so my question is, well, um, in your book, you didn't really cover, you know, your international operations and, um, myself looking at your website, um, you know, I find that you guys are very established worldwide. And so, um, you know, how did, how did you accomplish this, um, in a like ever changing world? And, um, you know, how were you able to communicate your run happy ethos and how do you compete, um, in countries with already, you know, very well established brands, you know, for example, like in Japan, they have Asics and Mizuno. So yep. how, how do you compete? We had a strategy offsite, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago, we had Howard Bihar of Starbucks fame speak to us. And he said, there's no such thing as a global brand. There's, there's brands that are big here and there and then go local and establish a brand locally. And I think that's the juxtaposition. You know, we want to be Brooks everywhere we are, but every country is different. And, and so our, our success has always been at, at getting involved and engaged in the running community and all of the influencers around that running community. It took us um, a long time in Europe to replay. We now have our whole playbook, our whole strategy is being executed in the, across the core countries of Europe and we're having great success. It took, it took a long time to put the foundations in to be able to execute our whole strategy, which is multi-channel, digital on top, and then connecting in real life with runners and, and where they run and so on and so forth. So um, I think we have to take one country at a time. We've not been successful at Japan. We're still trying to crack the code there. The local competition's super strong. We just entered China. You'll have to judge how good our timing was 10 years from now. Um, but they're running, that it's the second largest running population in the world. They're running crazy there right now. So, you know, we're, we're just starting there. And then in a country like Australia, we probably have the largest per capita market share there than any country but the U.S. So we've had, we're, we're not even across, and that's because success is created locally. It's, we're not going to create success in Italy or Japan um, or Norway from Seattle. We're just not. And yet the, the, the brand ethos and the products are, are coming from here, but we're going to localize them too. So we're learning how to do that. You know, we still challenge ourselves um, every time we get together on strategy. Um, you know, we, we're, the criticism to ourselves is we're kind of a U.S. company. Um, and if you ask the people working in Europe, they'll say that. So we're really, we're going to regionalize more and more things. And it's in our playbook now over the next three years. So, yeah. One at a time, you got to be local to be successful. Okay, there we go. Um, so again, kind of on the people side of things, uh, clearly teamwork's huge. I love the analogy that, that you pulled from the Miracle movie. Uh, the name on the, the back and the name of the It's okay, a hockey so analogy. It's, a great, it's, it's hockey, but it's a great one. Um, so on the community front, I know you've done a number of things, um, especially here in the U.S. And I'm just curious what your strategy is to take that yeah. more broad and bigger and in other places, or maybe you're already doing it. You know, I think what, what we know is that where we operate, we have to be a part of the community and be engaged. But in some ways... Um, you know, we, we punch above our weight in our industry, but we struggle to do that in the communities we're in because we don't have a vice president of community. So, you know, the other thing that we've done is really tried to figure out where we want to put our weight down. Where can we make an impact? And so, you know, obviously that's for the most part in, in getting people moving, getting kids moving, getting the community moving. Um, you know, the UN has, what, 17 critical factors that in, in human development. And, you know, there, there are many things there to work on and commit to and try to make an impact. And the health and wellness one is, is, is where we put our weight down. If we can make an impact in getting people moving, that's something positive in their lives and their community. And so, and, and then in, as well, you know, we, we have great products and, and if it's last year's colors or, or just excess inventory, which you always have in apparel and footwear, because, it's just part inventory. It's just part of the business. Um, we can put shoes on a lot of feet. And, and so we're engaged in many organizations that are working with the homeless community or, or people and families that, that literally just need shoes. And, and that's just so easy for us to do and support. So, you know, we're involved in things like that. The things we're, that we're really focused on to try to make a difference is going into uh, uh, 
now middle schools, but we've been mostly at high schools where, you know, PE is getting cut, sports are getting cut, the programs aren't funded. And, and the, the, sometimes the least funded programs are cross country and track. And so those coaches are volunteers and they, they're literally coming out of their own pocket to travel kids to meets and all of that. So we've got a, uh, we, we've, we've called it a books, a Brooks booster club, but we're morphing it and we're going to partner with marathon kids, which is a phenomenal organization to get kids moving in schools. Um, and so that's a huge commitment to it, you know, that we're making and it's going to be in the communities that we operate in, um, for sure. But so I think, I think that's where we, we know we can make the biggest impact because we have standing in that space and, and we can bring resources to bear. Um, and it's authentic to us. Um, we can, we can go bigger there. So I think that's another area of focus that I believe in. I mean, there's so many, um, needs in the community. We all know it, right. And it's, it's overwhelming, um, in business because just from our employees, you know, they're really looking for us to get more engaged and, in, in more of the challenges in our communities and, and all the things that are need problem solving. But I think for the brand, for the business, you know, we have this filter that we, we really try to anchor in where we have standing and where we can actually bring resources and make an impact. So getting people moving is, is where, um, that's where I want to be held accountable. That's, I want our brand to be held accountable in that space because I think we can make a difference there. Awesome. Thank you. Um, you spoke quite a bit about um, your family and, you know, me being a family man. I, I kind of wanted to know what advice you would give to future CEOs, presidents, leaders in the business world in their attempt to be present and focused in their workspace while also maintaining a work life balance. Mm. Well, um, my wife is in the audience today and she knows I wasn't always present and in the moment. I've learned more how to do that. I think I've become such a better leader and it, it literally took me to my 40s. To, to just, you know, take a breath and connect with people in the moment. And uh, that was a journey for me, but it's so important. And, and I think that's the thing I'm challenging myself to do. And that takes focus because I, I you know, I think I'm, I describe myself as an introvert that wants to be an extrovert, but it takes a lot of energy to, to work, you know, with lots of people. And I spend a lot of it at work and often, you know, don't have a lot left. So, so challenging myself to literally be in the moment and, and uh, not be that Danny Downer person wherever you, even, even with people in the community, right, from, from gas stations to retail to whatever. So that's something that, that I started to focus on in my 40s. Um, and I'm grateful for it. I'm a, I think I'm a better person, a better leader. But it's a choice, too, you know, and so... Um, I think, I think how you treat people is how you should be judged. And so, and also I think that as a leader, you know, I think trust is, is just such a currency to be trusted as a leader, you know, from everybody in our ecosystem, every constituency. So that's, you know, that's how you behave when things are tough, but it's also how you behave in the moment with people. So, you know, that's just something that I've, uh, I've really made a focus um, since I, I understood what it meant. I had my head down for the first 20 years of my career. Um, and then I lifted my head up and said, oh, you're supposed to actually connect with people. Who knew? Anyway, it's been a journey. But I think mean, it's, it's where joy comes from too, right? All, all you know, happiness and, and, and things that are fulfilling come with relationships with people. I think I talk about it a little bit, but I figured out too in business that achieving goals it's you, you go focus, go focus, go focus. And even in sport, right, you achieve something. And I found that actually, you know, there was kind of a letdown after that. So I quickly figured out it's about the journey. You know, you have to enjoy the journey. You have to, you have to enjoy the work and the people you're with and the, you know, and the, the struggle. And it's hard to enjoy that. But the point is that's where, that's where the satisfaction comes from. So that's another thing that I've learned is that the, the joy really is in the journey and the process. Um, and there's no finish line. I mean, we get to, we just keep playing season after season after season. So, um, the finish lines, we try to, one of the values at Brooks is to celebrate successes and mark milestones and for each, for people and for the business and the like, and our employee awards and the like. And that's what that's all about. It's about, you know, sort of celebrating the journey and, and, uh, the people you work with. So, uh, lessons learned for me, but I, 
it's a lot more fun that way too. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that answer. It uh, really resonated with me. Um, I just want to pivot a little bit. Um, this is kind of related to my own personal interests, but um, you give a great explanation and illustration in your book uh, about the grid you use to make uh, make and prioritize decisions. And as part of, part of this grid, your uh, strategic criticality uh, ranks the necessity of areas from a strategy and business point of view into win, compete, and play. Um, in the area of elite and Olympic level runners, Brooks is some excellent sponsored runners. I mean, you know, Josh Kerr. Um, but Nike seems to, you know, dominate this area right now. Um, and so my question is, where do you see the tie up with elite and Olympic level runners fitting into your strategy and how important is that to Brooks? And would you, uh, would that rank into uh, win, uh, compete, play and before you answer the question, um, I did see the um, the airplane, uh, the banner flying over the. You were there? Well, no, I saw it on television. Yeah. I was watching the race on television, and I thought it was fantastic. I- <laughs> I'm glad it made TV. We flew a plane around Hayward Field uh, during the 2012 Olympic trials, and Nike didn't like it. So, <laughs> um, and they, all it said was "run happy." How can you not like run happy? <laughs> anyway. Um, so, you know, when could he play? I think, I think uh, you know, it was really interesting. A case study in our industry is Under Armour. Great brand. They created, they created a phenomenal brand from a T-shirt. And, um, and, and it had incredible cachet. And they decided they're going right after Nike. They are going to compete with Nike. And they called Adidas their dumbest competitor. And two years later, Adidas was transcendent. And they were laying off people and, and unraveling college sponsors, you know, uh, sports sponsors, 10-year deals with UCLA. And, and they, they just ran out of gas. They just couldn't run at that pace. And you got to do soccer globally and the Olympics and everything else. So the, the playing field for professional athletics um, for sponsorship is massive. You know, we had we've had we have Olympians every cycle. We're super proud of these athletes, and we we have two teams, and then we have Maverick athletes that are just a good fit with Brooks, and and we sponsor them. And we're going to grow that program. So definitely, we see the power of athletes um, to inspire other people to run and and help us build the best product. So it, I wouldn't even put it in the win compete play. I think it's an essential part of our our ingredients for um, being an authentic brand. And being relevant and authentic to runners, incredible to runners. So it's essential. But we're trying to pick really great ambassadors for the sport that also have a shot at winning. Des Linden, Josh Kerr are a great example of that. Scott Jurek and Ultra in the last decade. So, you know, we're not going to have, I, I think, uh, I'm, I'm going to ruin the number. Nike must have 400 sponsored athletes just on the U.S. Olympic team. We had one. I, you know, so I think it's, it's a place that's, a, it's absolutely a priority for us, um, um, to be authentic and incredible. So it's going to be more of our mix going forward, but we've just had to be super selective because the, the thing about sporting goods brands is they're, they're really hard because you have to do it. You have to do product, You have to do credibility with influencers and athletes. You have to do great brand marketing. You have to great digital marketing. You got to bring newness and innovation. So you don't create products that are the same for 20 years. They have to evolve and, and things shift. So it's a very dynamic business and, and athletes are a key part of it. I think you'll see more of, we're going to globalize it too. So much more important in Europe and trail. Um, we're, we're really investing in the trail lifestyle and sport. And we've got a stable of athletes really starting in Europe on the trail side. So more to come. We have to be in the sport. It's, it's critical for us. And it, to me, it's, more, it's really an investment. You know, most of that program for Nike is in the marketing line item. It's not the business. The business is trainers, everyday trainers. So we have a lot of schools that are obviously on the big brands for competition, but many of those athletes are training in our shoes, which we love. I mean, they're training at Brooks. They have to compete in something else. So, But, it, you know, we would love to do more, but it's it's part of a mix that we have to balance. And we'll never be able to, you know, do what the big brands do. They're, they're, they're massively invested there. Probably to sell t-shirts and sweatshirts. 
You know, we have, I love this. My favorite stat is, is shoe counts at marathons. And, you know, Nike's done a nice job in speed. They've innovated. They've got some great go fast shoes now. But Houston Marathon was a great example. They had, I'm going to get the numbers close, 8,000 marathoners, 12,000 and a half. We were number two uh, to Nike in the, in the marathon on shoe counts, high-speed cameras, AI. They know exactly what shoes are being worn out there, almost by the model. And then in the half marathon, we were the number one brand with both men and women, and Nike was second. So that, to me, is a great data point. I love, I love shoe counts at races because you can't buy 20,000 runners at a Houston marathon. You can't, you can't sponsor all these people. They, they have to ch- choose and put their money. So... Okay, now some questions from the audience. Um, and the first one is about getting the right product. You mentioned that when you were talking about going regional and figuring out what you know, customers in different regions want. How do you or how does Brooks go around about making sure they're coming up with the right product for all the customers out there? Yeah, so we, um, we put a 2030 vision together around really creating a leading authentic performance running brand based on science and human in- runner insights. And so we now have two labs. And, and you know, our first lab is our biomechanics lab. And, and Brooks has always been, you know, starting with the biomechanics of human motion and what runners need and how the impacts change in running. We had some of the first stability shoes ever created in the 70s and 80s. So we've always been biomechanically based in our, in our design of footwear and, and run bras um, because they're pieces of equipment. Then in the last decade, we've uh, created a human insights lab. We call it the Run Sites Lab. And it was really inspired by IDEO, which is a San Francisco-based human design-driven, uh, human-driven design. And they do deep consumer insight mining um, in a really unique focus group format where you're trying to really understand, you know, you're doing shop along, run along, and you're in their closets and really trying to understand why they run and how they relate to product and what they need three years from now. That's the challenge we have is, is the shoe business is not like the t-shirt business. Our, our lead time on a new product is, is, is 18 to 24 months. So we have to, we have to, make, we have to do a brief now of what the runner is going to want in 24 months. So both of these labs have become absolutely foundational for us. And, and there's times where we, we do mine really unique insights that we can execute against um, uniquely and maybe faster or, or distinctively from other brands. But even even more than that, they give our teams confidence in what we're building and why we're building it, who we're building it for. And, you know, we challenge ourselves. We should know more about running and runners than any other group of people in the world. And that's our, so that's our task. We, we, we need to do that. So I think in the biomechanical research side, we do. Everybody has labs, but our labs are focused on the right questions and and we publish papers. We have university-level research on the biomechanics of motion and injury, and, and it informs our product. But the human factor side and the, the you know, mining for insights on latent needs and, and why people attach to certain brands um, in running and so on and so forth, um, we've got about eight or nine people in that group now, and they're doing global research in China, Europe, and in here, really trying to inform uh, our go-to-market. So... I, I think it's those are the those are the toughest judgments to make, and and you got to be right. You got to be in the ballpark anyway. Um, so we spend a lot of energy and effort there, and that's where innovation comes from. You have to see it where before other people do. So the next question may have been Lance's next question uh, coming from the audience, though. So what ad, what advice? What career advice would you have given your twenty one year old self, based upon your experience since then? Oh man. I should have known that question was coming. Um, um, boy, I, I wished I would have um, lifted my head up. I was, I, was a, I was a great analyst, and I, was, I learned how to analyze industries and companies and brands and, and build strategies from that, and, and I loved it. But I wished I would have lifted my head up and, and you know, built stronger relationships with people along the way. And I had mentors. Sometimes they didn't know they were mentoring me. I was just watching everything they did, how they made decisions, how they communicated. I was just going to school on all these leaders that I admired and many of them that I was working around. So, um, and only in the book did they find out they mentored me and made an impact. So, you know, I think um, taking more time 
um, to really build relationships um, along the way. Um, so I had I was I was busy and on a mission, and and we had a young family, and so I viewed my life as work, family, and my hobby was how good is this running? I mean, my, it really was my hobby was running before I got to Brooks, so um, that was that was that was really exciting for me. But that, that my life was pretty simple in those years. I think this might be the last one. Um, you mentioned earlier about uh, Brooks' desire to be inclusive. Uh, and this question is about, you know, diversity. How, how does Brooks define diversity? How do you, as a CEO, uh, hold yourself accountable to making sure the organization is meeting the diversity, equity, inclusion goals yeah. that you yeah. have? Yeah, I think, you know, the power of diversity is teams are stronger than an individual. And so, Getting a diverse team together of talented people uh, is gonna is gonna is going to win more than not. I believe that um, equity is about human dignity and fairness. Table stakes. The real challenge is inclusion. That's my point. The real opportunity and challenge for inclusion, which is which is a higher, it, it takes it takes a it takes more. I would say than just getting the numbers right. Um, it's, it's really about human connection and engagement and, um, being welcomed and being, being respected. So I, I think you can't have a team without respect and, and dignity, but I think in our sport, in, in, in the lifestyle of run, it's up to all of us in the industry, not just to say, Hey, everybody's welcome, but to make them feel welcome and included. And that's where the work is. Um, I think that's, that's the real work because, um, that's what's going to keep, that's what's going to make it be diverse 5, 10, 15 years from now. You can hit numbers, but if they're not feeling included and, uh, and it's a place that, that they're, they, can, they can be themselves and do meaningful work and make an impact and, and be part of this team, that's, that's the highest level for me. And so I think, you know, we're, we're working the whole puzzle, but also in the industry, you know, I think, I think we've got to invite more people that haven't historically felt included in the sport. Um, that's not just sending them an application for a 5K. You know, we've got to bring them in and, and get in, in the right way and, and include their communities in the sport. So there's a lot of good work going on in our industry. But again, you know, it was sort of a wake-up call because, you know, we used to say running is the most inclusive sport in the world because anybody can just go out their back door. And, you know, the truth is on, in a lot of areas of the sport is a lot of people did not feel included. So there's great discussions. We are a founding member of the Running Industry Diversity Coalition. It includes brands and retailers and, and uh, running events and, and promoters of running events. And there's now 400 members in that community. And, and, uh, and, and we've, we've invested to make it permanent. So we've hired an executive director and, and we're on the path. Uh, but I think inclusion is is the ultimate goal for me. Great. On that very positive and important note, uh, let's thank Jim Weber and our panelists for being with us tonight. Thanks, guys. Thank you.